and welcome to Yep Legal, a monthly series where we cover legal issues affecting our community. My name is Mahalit McConan, and today I'll be moderating a Know Your Rights panel hosted by Yuri Ethiopian Professionals in partnership with the Ethiopian American Bar Association. As the United States is confronted with the country's long-standing racial and social injustice, and protests over police brutality continue to royal cities, now is the right time to examine the rights afforded to every individual, no matter what race or legal status, when it comes to engaging with law enforcement and the legal system in general. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to Martinez Jackson, who is a graduate of Howard University, University School of Law. Martinez began his career as a junior associate in Du Bois and Pl Plimpton, Plumpton's litigation department before serving as a prosecutor in the District of Columbia. His book, Justice My Way, Memoirs of a Black Prosecutor, memorializes his experience serving in that role. He frequently travels the country visiting grade schools and sharing his perspective about the criminal justice system with students. He currently owns and operates Jackson Legal Services, PLLC. His firm focuses on criminal defense, personal injury, and police misconduct cases. It is my pleasure to have you with us today, Martinez, and I look forward to our discussion. Without further ado, can you start us off by explaining the basic rights citizens have when approached by a police officer, and how do these rights apply to citizens versus non-citizens, and in particular, undocumented individuals? Yeah, so my lad, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I think this topic is um, very germane to what's going on um, today in society. Um, and, and just to start off answering your question, um, it really depends on the circumstances of the case uh, with respect to what your rights are. So if you haven't been charged with an offense, right, you're not under arrest, um, then generally you have the right to tell the police that you're free to leave and that you are going to leave. Um, and so you can ask the police, hey, am, am I free to go? Am I under arrest? Um, you know, am I a suspect in this crime or um, in this particular incident? And if you're not, then you're, you're free to leave. Um, now, on the other hand, if you are a suspect or if you are in detention, if you are under arrest, um, then you do have a few rights. Uh, most of us have heard of the Miranda warnings. We've heard of the Fifth Amendment. And essentially what that means is if the police are going to interrogate you while you're in custody, then they have to read you certain rights and warnings before they ask you questions. And if they don't do that, then potentially those um, statements that you make to the police could be uh, excluded in court if the, if the police try to use that against you. Um, and so you have the right obviously to remain silent. And I always advise my clients or prospective clients to do so. Um, you having a right to an attorney. And if you can't afford attorney in a criminal case, at least the court will uh, appoint an attorney for you. And the same is true for people who are, are non-citizens or undocumented individuals who are who just so happen to be on U.S. soil. They um, they, they maintain the same rights as typical citizens do. Thank you. That's very helpful because um, there are a lot of, you know, the community, especially the immigrant community is very, um, you know, there are some complex uh, laws that they're not privy to. So it's it's important to know that everyone has equal rights uh, when they are in this country, uh, regardless of their legal status. And following up on that, you know, there are different types of law enforcement officers. Obviously, there's uh, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, in addition to, you know, the everyday police officer that approaches uh, folks on the street. Um, so in terms of that, can you explain to us if that changes how individuals should answer questions when approached by different police officers? Or if at all, does this, does this change their interactions? Really good question, uh, especially here in the DMV area where you have uh, a number of different type of law enforcement agencies, right? You have uh, Secret Service, you have Park Police, you have the FBI, you have ICE. And so the question is, you know, what are my rights when I'm confronting different agencies? Um, but the same theory really applies. I mean, uh, no matter who the agency is, law enforcement, their goal is to solve a crime. 
Um, you know, obviously, technically, they're supposed to protect the community. But anytime they're asking you questions, just keep in mind that their goal is not necessarily to help you per se. Right. Their goal is to solve a crime. And that could be the FBI, the CIA or whoever it is. And so my advice to most people would be no matter the law enforcement agency across the board, it's almost always best to, to remain silent and to invoke your right to an attorney unless, you know, your life is in danger and you need to, to give the police or law enforcement some type of information to to um, to protect you or someone you love. No, that that's that's uh, very helpful to know. Um, and, you know, following up on that, everyone has heard, you know, you have the right to remain silent during questions by law enforcement. This is the general rule. Are there any exceptions to this general rules that individuals should know when being approached by police officers or any other um, officer of the law for that matter? No, I mean, as long as it's law enforcement and they are questioning you while you are detained, while you are in custody, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're in handcuffs. If you don't feel that you are free to leave, which means that law enforcement has um, established some type of force or presence, which would suggest to you that you're not free to go, then you can you can refuse to speak to them. The only exception is um, if you're entering the United States across borders um, and custody customs officers ask you questions about why you're entering the United States, then you could be denied entry if you don't answer those questions, right? But you still can refuse to answer questions. There'll just be a consequence associated with that. No, that, that's very helpful. And in terms of another right is a, a right to have an attorney. And um, obviously there are a lot of people that cannot afford to have an attorney uh, present. And so um, can you describe what their options are if, uh, and also in terms of if, you, if you're not um, documented, do you also have the same rights to have an attorney? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. In most criminal matters in the United States, if you cannot afford an, an attorney, you have a right to have one appointed to you by the court. Now, there is an exception to ICE hearings. Um, some ICE hearings where um, you're facing deportation, you may not necessarily be entitled to an attorney that is uh, issued to you by the government. So that is one wrinkle, just given the nature, depending on the nature of the um, the offense and the reason that they're bringing you up for deportation, you may not be entitled to a free attorney. However, there are um, the, the, the Department of Justice actually keeps a database of pro bono legal services. And you can go on DOJ.gov and you'll see that they have those um, available to you. Obviously, you have the ACLU. Oftentimes they will offer pro bono services in those situations. And then you can consult your local bar associations because usually um, they will have resources that you can tap into in the event that you are not uh, provided um, legal counsel. But in most instances, um, if it's a criminal case, non-ICE related, you're probably going to be appointing an attorney if you can't afford one. So on this point of um, the rights that individuals have when stopped or searched by a police officer or ICE officer, um, Obviously, these rights extend to uh, not only just a stop on the on the street, but also a car search uh, as well as a house search. And um, you know, the law states that a police officer can only stop, search, arrest you under certain circumstances. Um, there are exceptions, an exception within exceptions. Um, you know, the line between these you know, what's allowable and what's not, uh, it really, it's complex for the everyday individual. And really, like you said in the beginning, it depends on the situation. So let's go back and let's break it down a little bit by uh, the situation, right? A stop, a car search, and a house search. Um, mm -hmm. So let's start, start first off with um, breaking it down, what type of reasons police may have to, to stop and arrest someone just walking down the street. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's sad. And this is why a lot of people are advocating for reform. Um, in most jurisdictions, police can pretty much arrest and stop you for any misdemeanor offense, almost any misdemeanor offense. Um, there are a few exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, 
if you commit a misdemeanor or they believe you committed a misdemeanor in their presence, um, they have the authority to arrest you. So let's just look at some examples. Think of Sa Sandra Bland, right? Sandra Bland, um, she was stopped by police for a basic traffic stop that most people would think would just be issued a ticket and they'd be on their way. But the police officer in this situation, for whatever reason, believed that it was more appropriate to arrest her. And so she was taken into custody and then a few days later she was found, uh, or I don't even know if it was days later, but a few hours later she was found hanging in her cell. She had committed suicide, right? Eric Garner was arrested for misdemeanor selling loose cigarettes. Um, so pretty much the police, sadly, if they have probable cause to believe you committed some type of offense, for the most part, if they really want to, they can arrest you, but they have to have probable cause. No, that's exactly um, actually where it hinges, right? Probable cause. Now for someone that may not know, you know, you mentioned some of the probable cause, like a traffic light violation. Um, you know, they have some reason to suspect that um, you're committing a crime or you're in the process of committing a crime. You've committed a crime and fleeing that, uh, that scene. Um, in terms of search, you know, they can stop you. So um, if they are probable cause, how can they search you? What is that limitation of like, how much can they search you? Your body, um, your car, your vehicle, what is the extent and the limitation that police officers have even with probable cause? Yeah, so there are, there are a few different types of stops. One is called a Terry stop, which is really, I mean, it, it, it kind of gained popularity in New York with t stop and frisk and essentially it's a lower standard than probable cause. If, if the officer has some type of hunch or reasonable suspicion that you might be up to something uh, and they can articulate that reason, then they can stop you and pat you down, pat the outside of your pockets. They can pat your body down on the outside to see whether or not you have some type of weapon, right? To protect them. Now, if they actually have probable cause to arrest you, I mean, they pretty much can, can search your whole body, right? They can, they, can, they can search your body. And if you were in a car, um, they pretty much, they can search that car too, as long as they have probable cause. Um, typically they wouldn't search the trunk, but it depends on what it's probable cause for, right? If it's probable cause for you holding, a, uh, having a gun or drugs, then there may be reason to believe that you're hiding something in the trunk. So they might check the trunk too. That's true. All right. But if it's just probable cause that you owe child support, um, that may not be a good reason for them to go in the trunk. That hasn't established probable cause for anything else. Right? So, right, right. And so what do you say to someone, let's say that they're in a vehicle that is not their vehicle, they're a passenger in that vehicle, and the police have probable cause to stop the person driving the car. Is the person that's a passenger, do they, also stay and get searched or, or, or can they leave or what are their recourses if they're just traveling with with that person yeah i mean at the end of the day there's a practical answer and then there's a uh, theoretical answer the uh, theoretical answer is if they don't have probable cause to search you then they should not be searching you right now does that mean you should from a practical standpoint become combative and refuse and, and you know jerk away if they do decide to search you, I would say don't do that. Because even though technically they, they don't have probable cause, they still might do it anyway. Um, and it's best for you to you know return home safely, not have any other charges brought against you or worse, um, you know, just confronting the police. No, that you raise a great point, especially as we're seeing, um, you know, the continued um, police brutality against individuals um, having minor uh, offenses or no offenses at all just by existing that the best course of action is to remain calm and uh, heed instructions as much as possible but also know your rights because um, knowing your rights and what you mentioned earlier by saying am I free to leave um, uh, am I under arrest? Uh, all of those things will help you because if you if you say those things, you oftentimes may be able to go. In the process is also.
so very crucial. And with that point of knowing your rights, uh, we just, what could happen when you're being stopped, uh, including a car stop. But one thing a lot of people don't know is that they do have rights when it comes to uh, the police coming to their homes. A lot of people don't know what those limitations are. What if a police officer comes, you know, obviously it depends, are they coming because there's an arrest warrant for someone and they're coming to get that person or are they coming to search that person? Um, so can you uh, elaborate a little, bit, a, a little bit on that issue and what those rights are uh, when a police officer comes uh, and uh, you know knocks on uh, someone's door? What are their recourses? Definitely, um, good question. You know, typically the law, um, offers the most protection to the home, right? Uh, it's supposed to be the person's castle and the place that you should feel the most safe. Um, so essentially, unless the police have a warrant, um, then they have no authority to enter your home unless you give them consent. Um, and so if the police come to the door and they're knocking on your door and they're ask, asking you questions, you can always once again ask, hey, do you have a search warrant? Do you have an arrest warrant for anyone at this location? If you can't produce that, then I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to end this. Um, I'm going to have to end this encounter, this interaction, and and I, I don't really want to speak with you. There are some exceptions to the warrant requirement. Let's say that the police are um, chasing a fleeing felon, and that felon somehow runs into your house, runs into your open door, or something like that. They actually can chase that person into your um, into your home and then apprehend that person, right? Uh, because of exigent circumstances. But short of that, really, there's no reason for the police to be in your home without a warrant. No, that's a great point. And especially that the home gets the strongest protection. I don't, I don't think not, not a lot of people know that. And one thing to highlight, though, and, you know, I'll let you do it. You're the criminal defense attorney. And this is your area is um, there are other people outside of yourself that can consent to a house search. And so what are those, you know, just so people are aware that it's not just them, if there are others living in their home, they can consent to a search. Absolutely. So as long as when the police come, the person who gives consent has the apparent authority to give consent. Um, and apparent authority just means that a, a reasonable person looking at this person would assume that they have authority to allow the police into the home. Right. So if they come to the door and it's their it's a five year old um, and the five year old says, yeah, you can come in. That may not be apparent consent because a, a reasonable person would know that five year old can't give consent. But if it's somebody else who looks like they live there and they look like an adult, then um, they need to know uh, the, that they shouldn't give consent to the police to come into the house, even if they don't own the house. Thank you. That That's a very important point. Um, that roommates or um, partners uh, that that do live there, you know, and and I think the the key term is a parent. So really, they don't have to be on the lease <laughs> to be able to consent um, to the exactly. search of their home. And you know, following up on that, let's say, you know, what if an individual speaks to law enforcement officers without asking for an attorney? What if that individual? Um, just doesn't remain silent, doesn't exercise their right. And, you know, it could be forced, it could not be forced. Uh, um, there are different situations um, or their house is searched without a warrant. What if the stop search arrest or seizure um, in the situation was illegal? What are, you know, after the fact, what are some of their recourses? Right, right. So number one, if you, if you speak to law enforcement without an attorney, um, as I'm pretty sure you've heard the standard language, anything you say or do can be used against you in a court of law. So they will do that. Right. And that's their job to try to um, close a case. That's the police's job. They want to close a case. So to the extent they can get someone to admit to something that they're happy with that. Right. Because that makes their job easy. Um, so the, the answer to that question is, if you speak to law enforcement without an attorney, you open yourself up to liability. And that happens all the time. Now, if the police coerce you or if they speak to you um, without letting you know what your rights are, then there's potentially a, um, a constitutional violation there. And a number of things could happen. Number one, that statement could be excluded 
and they may not be able to use it against you. And if they do use it against you and the court rules that it was a violation, you could bring a claim against them for civil damages. Right. And and that kind of goes into the second uh, question that you asked. What do you do if you're stopped, if you're searched, if you're seized uh, without cause? Well, you should you should call an attorney that brings police misconduct cases um, and you should file a claim against the police. Um, and the rules are very strict in most jurisdictions. So you have to give notice that you intend to sue the government within a year. Um, so contacting a an attorney as soon as possible uh, is very important in those cases. Thank you. Those are very, very important uh, advice, especially uh, during the current times right now. So to we've covered uh, searching uh, of a person, a uh, car, a house, what to do if you didn't exercise your rights and after the fact. So to wrap up our discussion here, what are some of the things that people can do to help protect themselves from illegal stops, searches, and seizures? Some tips that they can uh, refer to as they navigate this uh, this crazy world. Yeah. I understand. And and it's a good question because unfortunately you can't control a uh, police officer's behavior, right? Um, if you look at the Philando Castillo case, if you, you look at it from his standpoint, he did everything right that he could have done. He explained to the police that he had a gun, that it was registered. He was going for his registration and the police still shot him in front of his um, girlfriend and his child. And there are times where it seems like you could do everything and you're still penalized for it. Right. Um, so really the goal, is to, the goal is to leave police encounters safely, as safely as possible and to avoid making the situation worse. So I think you can do that by just obeying their commands. Um, don't make any statements. Uh, you know, let them know that, look, if I'm under arrest, I want an attorney. If I'm not under arrest, then please let me go. Um, and if your rights are violated, make sure you contact a civil rights attorney immediately. Thank you so much for uh, this insightful discussion. Uh, and I'm certain that this would be very helpful to our YUP community and our community at large. And uh, if you would like to learn more about the rights that we've discussed here today, uh, you can contact YUP or your and professionals. YUP will be offering a Know Your Rights uh, resource on our website, so please keep an eye out for that. And it, you can also reach out to Martinez on his website, Jackson Legal Services for Legal Representation. Uh, he's very competent uh, regarding the issues that we discussed today. Uh, so I would like to thank you again, Martinez. Thank you, the audience, for viewing. And please stay safe until our next Yep Legal series. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you for having me.